All right. <clears throat> so this section is going to move on to classification. This is where usually people get excited um, because it's uh, less complex. I don't know. It's more fun, I think, uh, than NER tagging. But NER tagging is just a complex classification problem. So we've actually been doing classification from the beginning. There are just specific tools for those types of classification. Okay. But classification is a huge component to natural language processing. This is one of the main things that people do with it. So it might be sentiment classification, it might be document classification, it could be lots of different things. Okay. So kind of a super important part of the course, but do know that part of speech tagging, dependency parsing, and NER tagging are just special types of classification. Uh, and what we do this do with this stuff is we use it to cluster or categorize or group documents based on sort of some sort of attribute of that document. So right now, like the current um, sort of hubbub in the world, in the U.S. anyway, is um, the war that Trump is having with Twitter, because they have some sort of algorithm. They might have done this manually. I don't know, but they have some sort of algorithm that marks dubious facts. And I don't know if they only do this with people with a check mark or not. I don't totally understand their, how this works. But the idea is that things that are posted in tweets that may or may not be totally accurate get this little like circle with an exclamation point that says learn more about. So if it's not quite true or not quite accurate, it kind of does a little fact checking. Okay. So that has to be some sort of algorithm. I can't imagine that they do any of that human wise. They might remove those tags human-wise, but Facebook has similar things where they remove um, or flag certain types of things. Okay? Those are based on the attributes of that document. Okay? It's especially useful when we have lots of documents. That's why I said I don't think it cannot be done by human because there's just so much where so much going on. I mean, like how many tweets I get in a minute must be crazy. And so we don't have the time or the energy to read them all. And this could be applied, classification is a big part of analytics just in general. Um, it's not only applied to documents, but it can be music, images, video, etc. So this is not, a, you know, NER tagging is an, is an LP problem. <laughs> classification is like kind of a broad scheme of different things. All right. <clears throat> so, so far we have done tagging, which is part of speech, um, named entity recognition or NERs. Parsers, which is uh, dependency and constituency parsing. And all of those, like I said, are specialized forms of classification that have specialized rules and algorithms that we already are well aware of. So now we're going to explore how to build just a straight classifier, a regular one. No, um, you the one that could be applied to lots of different scenarios, but focusing specifically on feature extraction. Okay. And so how do I take classification, which is something you've probably had. A lot of students have taken the machine learning class. Um, how do I apply that to text? And so the main goal is to take our documents and figure out how to classify them. And these labels can be whatever you'd like. So sentiment is also a special type of classification problem, but we'll cover that more in a couple weeks um, towards the end. Uh, I could you know, project that I've been working on are classifying documents as include them or don't include them. Uh, it could be tags for labels. So like we're going to um, look at Stack Overflow questions. So it could be anything. And you can perform classification on pre-labeled data. That's considered supervised learning. It's supervised because you have the answer and you can check against the known answer. Uh, or unlabeled data, which is unsupervised learning, where you're just kind of clustering things together or giving them labels based on what you think is probably accurate. And then the sentiment section will do both of those. Every document still needs to be cleaned. So that whole text cleaning normalization stuff still applies to classification techniques. Generally, most of them are removed with stop words and punctuation as well. Depends on the goal. So some terminology, what can I classify? Well, so a lot of the sentiment classifiers are based on individual words. And so I can put individual words into categories. These are positive words. These are negative words. I can put them 
um, into different uh, types, or I can focus on phrases and sentences. Right? So how those um, plagiarism checkers work is this kind of classification at the sentence level, usually phrases, because if I looked at individual words, uh, everything would be highlighted. Right? I could classify tweets. This is a pretty popular thing to do, the whole bot or not um, classifier that's on Twitter. It's written, there's a really popular one written by Mike Kearney. Um, he's awesome. If you want a like text person to follow on Twitter. Uh, tweets, sentiment, personality, there's lots of stuff that people are doing with tweets. And then you can use the document. Document here does not have to be like Word document, um, but because people often talk about documents as any of these things, except words. So when I say document, it could be a sentence, it could be a tweet, or it could be a lot of text. And often I have some sort of predefined class that I want to take these documents and classify them as. Right? Sentiment is the arguably the one of the most popular things. I mean, this class used to be called sentiment analytics before I finally got it fixed, <laughs> because you can't do 16 weeks of sentiment. Right? Um, but it's easily super interesting to folks. Right? And there are lots of business applications for that. Um, so positive, negative, neutral. We could actually give it a real score too. That would be more regression type analysis, um, which is what uh, a lot of places do to help identify a match. So like Netflix or some other places would be like 85% match based on what you used to watch, that kind of thing. I could classify things as their type. So I know how to get keywords to them, and then just anything, anything you want. That's the fun stuff about this, is that the labels are up to you. Now if you're going to, excuse me, I just finished a cup of coffee. Whew. Um, if you're going to make up your own labels, you might have to have your own training data for those labels. Um, but an unsupervised task, generally that's what you're doing, is coming up with the labels. Um, and other analyses, and we'll show you very briefly, I'll show you some topics analyses, can help reveal what the labels should be. So cluster analysis and topics, some of these unsupervised tasks, are really useful at sort of elucidating or revealing, making known what the labels might be, um, what labels you might use for a supervised task later. Okay, so they're not always done in isolation. So, example, a spam classifier, which is part of the assignment, although I might change the assignment for this because the spam him when I'm over <laughs> at the moment. Um, so I'll see if I can come up with a new data set for us. But a spam classifier is really uh, important. And so what we see, and then, and then Microsoft has this new, like, clutter box. I'm like, is clutter spam? or the, not spam? What is this clutter box? I would consider this spam. This is a bunch of stuff that I can't seem to unsubscribe from. <laughs> right? But we have some sort of input, we run a classifier, and then we get an output right, with the labels. So an unsupervised machine learning task does not require pre-labeled data, and the focus is on pattern finding. What are the latent structures in the data? So we can run the factor analysis, cluster analysis, principal components, topics. You could do this with a latent semantic analysis. What else? Anything where we're creating dimensionality in the data. Multidimensional scaling. There we go. I knew there was one more. Okay. And a lot of those I'll focus on in my other class. And sometimes this is called feature engineering to help find those meaningful patterns, but really that Label is just a nice term for interpretive dance where you're trying to look at the, what the answer is and interpret it. Uh, and those are some examples I just gave. Supervised tasks, on the other hand, require some sort of set of pre labeled data beforehand. So, <clears throat> this is where websites like Kaggle are really useful, but if you have a very specific type of thing you're trying to build, you might also have to build your own training data. So let's say you're trying to, um, I'm really interested in the way that people do support tickets, and not for any research reason, just because I find it interesting, of how they've decided, like when you're when you're filling out, like I need help, and they have like the drop-down box that you pick, 
right? Does that actually go where you say, or do they look at what you type and then also use that to classify? I've always wondered this. Um, because often they email you back something totally unintelligible, right? Uh, so how do I, if I'm looking at the, what someone's writing is for text for their problem, how do I define um, what type of problem it is and where it should go? Uh, and so that would require some sort of pre-labeled data. So previous data, we've already had problems you've solved. <clears throat> Features are then extracted to help us predict those categories. And there are so many ways to do this. We're just going to show you a couple of them, the most popular ones, but there are lots of ways to extract features. And technically, when everybody's blattering on about logistic regression, is machine learning. I know logistic regression is math. It can be used as statistics, which I have done, or it could be used as the math for prediction technique, right? So technically, regular regression is just a form of supervised learning, right? You have a continuous outcome that you're trying to predict, and you're trying to see how close you can get. But generally, when we talk about classification, we're trying to predict a categorical outcome with some technique, log, naive base, support vector machine, some one of these math options that we have that help us classify or predict um, categorical outcomes. So in theory, any type of analysis that is predicting is doing this kind of classification. Most people don't consider regular regression um, a classification technique or machine learning technique because the outcomes are continuous. But practically, it's the same idea. I'm trying to predict and get as close to that to the right answer as possible. So, <clears throat> first thing we're going to do is figure out how to do feature extraction or feature engineering, and what might be predictive of our categories. Generally, this is at the word level because um, words are very useful units to help us predict. So we'll figure out the feature extraction. That's what we're going to focus here because that's the purpose of the NLP. And then we'll pick an algorithm and I'll show you a couple of algorithms that you may or may not have seen before to help us map those features onto our category labels. And then once you pick the algorithm, you'll separate your data into training and um, testing data. So you have to train your model and then test it on a second data set. Okay. You don't actually have to, but it's usually good practice. Um, Cross-validation and cross-fold, all those other techniques still apply. We're going to kind of leave those alone for the machine learning class. Uh, but we'll split our data set into pieces and see if the data, uh, the model that we've built, um, applies from one to the other. And then you can improve by tweaking the parameters of that model. Okay. Sometimes these are called hyperparameters. And generally that is done naturally based on the type of algorithm you've picked. Um, you can include more training data, right? I don't tend to like literally go in there and turn the knobs. Um, <clears throat> but here often the, the choice is of the type of algorithm. The tuning is done based on what, which one you picked. All right, after we do our training, we're going to explore if that model is any good by looking at metrics like accuracy, precision, recall. And then I have maybe a dev testing set that I can use to improve my model. And so this often will tell me, you know, as a first test, if that feature extraction method works. And if it's totally crap, you would have to pick maybe a different feature extraction. So you can kind of go back and forth like, Here's a feature extraction. Here's my development testing. Hmm, that didn't work. Here's another one. Here's my development testing. You can kind of work through until you find the best one and then test again on a final data set that shows you um, expansion into new data or generalization is sometimes what this is called, where you can show that your model works on testing data and new data. <clears throat> All right, so this could be a binary task where we have two classes or categories and you assign each document just one of those labels. So one of the things I've been working on is a yes or no type task. 
or it could be what's called a multi-class classification or multinomial is another name for this, where we have three or more categories, but you're still assigning each document to only one of those categories. We could also do multi-label classification where you assign them one or more labels. And that's more popular with unsupervised algorithms when you know how much the, um, the clusters overlap. So in a topics analysis, I could say that this document is these two topics, giving it two labels, because I get the probability of each of those. Okay. In classification, you don't tend to do this as much. I don't see multi-label classification quite as often, but we could do this if we had four or five categories. We could look at the probability of each outcome and assign it the two top two labels. So often the analyses are the same, but the the output decision is different. So I could still use something like logistic regression, but instead of picking the most probable category, I could pick the two most probable categories. And you'll see in our example that that might actually work a little bit better for some specific tasks. And so I love this picture. I, it's from one of the textbooks. Um, I just think it's such a great representation of this whole process. So. We have some sort of training set and some sort of testing set. We've got the classes, so we have to have the labels. <clears throat> and then we have the documents from which we want to classify. They go through text normalization, and I think it's super great that they include this section, but the, this textbook has like two whole chapters on normalization, so good on them. This is all of our cleanup stuff. Some sort of feature extraction, so you know, this is week one and two, this is where we're at now. That feature extraction, we end up with a documents by features matrix. Okay. Um, sometimes people call this a TDM or term by document matrix. You'll see that that um, it means the same approximate thing. We put it into some sort of supervised algorithm here, like log or phase. And that builds ourselves into a model. Okay, so the model is the algorithm applied to the data. And we're going to use that model, but now let's test it. So we have our testing documents, right? It goes through the same normalization and feature extraction, and we end up with our features that look in the same, have the same shape and feel as training features. Okay, we can't show um, a model new features at this stage. So I'll highlight in the code where that happens. We want to throw a model, it'll predict some classes for us, and we'll see, we'll compare now against the testing classes. Did we get it right or not? So the first time when you fit a model, you show it to training classes, and when you evaluate a model, you um, hide the training classes until you get to accuracy. And we'll come back to this, but mainly here, this is what I want to focus on, is we're going to work, oh, that doesn't work here, highlight here, feature extraction, um, is the main focus for today. All right, so here's everything we're gonna use. So we're gonna do this all in Python because it just works better. Okay, you can do this stuff in R. I am an R person, but I prefer Python for this. It runs faster and it works better. Uh, Scikit-learn is, is pretty awesome. Jensen is also awesome, which we'll use next week or maybe the week after next. I don't remember, but we'll get there at some point. So we're going to use this 20 news groups data as an example. Between classes and data. So let me back up this slide here. Between these. Or between training and prediction. Training classes and documents. Okay, so the documents is the text itself. So let's say we're trying to predict the sentiment of tweets. The tweets are the documents, and then we have an answer in, a, in this kind of task where people have already classified them as positive and negative. So we're trying to train a model to do that for us in the future for the ones we don't have the answer for. So the classes are the, the answers. We're trying to build the model to predict. <clears throat> Documents is the text we're trying to predict from. So in practical regression terms, this is X and this is Y. Perfect. 
weren't you a python no i'm not a python person i am turning into a i tolerate python person <laughs> i actually do most of my work in r um unless i'm doing this stuff and then i do it in python yep i love r but i'm a statistician and that's the language that's what r was written for is stats people right python written for nebulous i don't know what people <laughs> right um no i'm nlp runs better in python i will admit this after teaching this for many semesters now um but i'm definitely an r person <clears throat> if you take my other class you would hear the like r runs this so much better <laughs> lecture um but for this class it definitely is a python does this so much better all right that aside um we're gonna use all this stuff okay, i see you typing down there most of this is our cleanup code right? i'll let you type real quick i'm gonna see why the cat is screaming in something temporary visitor turns out that we locked him in the room all day and so he was not happy about it so say hi to Bruce and now Bruce will run away <clears throat> um, I am a dog person <laughs> I like cats too I'm an equal opportunity program and animal person he is He's, um, while we're off track temporarily, uh, 18 this year, so I've had him for a very long time. Wait, someone was typing when we took this pause. I'm trying to see. There's your question. Okay, I was like, you were typing. Where did it go? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, normally for sentiment classifications, like Spanish, oh man, you're getting like deep into it here. Okay, so sentiment classification tasks. Well, spam and ham is not really sentiment because sentiment is really positive and negative. Um, but any type of classification, knife base normally turns out better. But would a long short term memory model outperform? Hmm. In my experience, no. They often will give me the same performance, but this is limited experience because I just started doing um, those type of neural net models, and I would not say that I am the best at them. Um, so what I've seen so far of them working with text is that they will get me as good as a... Um, regular like log or base kind of model but to get them to perform better than that I often have to over train them and then they don't generalize so they don't I can I can train them and get the loss pretty low um, but I can't get it to perform that well on a second data set any better than you know, like the secondary test is the same as these other ones. So in those scenarios, I tend to go with the simpler models because simpler is better often. Like they don't take as long or as much energy to run. But what people can do with those long short-term memory models are kind of amazing. So I'm not saying they're bad. I would say my limited experience, I don't see them running a whole lot better than the more traditional models. <clears throat> And we're going to do word to vec, and you'll kind of see that. Yep. Oh, see, I'll beat you to it. A half a sentence early. Yes, we will talk about word to vec. I do love, I do love word to vec, but it's a simple neural net. A long short-term memory obviously is a deep learning technique, a more complicated neural net. Word net is a simple one. And we'll talk about feature embedding wise, what the difference is between what we're going to get to 
and those models. And kind of my uh, personal opinion on which one you should use. And obviously one that works, but if they both work, use the simpler one is always my answer. All right, so great question. All right, so cat interlude and questions. Now moving on. All right. The 20 news groups data is a difficult task. So this is one reason that I like Doing this example is a, not a simple yes or no task. Let's do a complicated task to show you the power of the feature extraction. And so we would really need to clean out all the formatting. So the news groups data is like Reddit, right? So it's just a bunch of people yapping. And what we'll try to do is predict which news group it went into. Okay. Uh, so we could do this with Reddit. <laughs> kinds of data. You would pull the subreddits and see if you could predict which ones, predict the differences between them. Um, or we could do this, uh, I think it's my other class, I have Stack Overflow data, where we're trying to predict which lang computer language they're talking about. Okay. So we need to text process this first. Okay. So um, this particular code here is just because it is a data set that's embedded and there's something weird about personally about the way that they embed Python data sets. They're not like nice pandas data frames. They're these like weird structure things, I think, to save um, computing space. Uh, so this problem here is only because the data set comes from a package. Okay. So essentially what we're doing is just kind of creating data that we can use. And so specifically, um, especially this code here, is only really for this data set. So we'll look at another example where we just import a CSV. Okay. But what you really need to have this work is two columns. One column with the text, one column with the labels. And so whatever you need to do to get into that kind of thing, text and labels. Okay. In this case, they have label numbers as well. That's actually not necessary. You just need the name. Okay. There's no reason to factor. All right, so what we've got though, is we've split this up. So we've got the, um, uh, the sorry, my brain here. Data frame is being built from the corpus, which is the data itself. So the, the text of the uh, subreddit, the post, right? The label itself, which is what, sorry, it's over here. Um, the target label, I think here is a number. And then the target name is the, the what subgroup it is. Hockey, hardware, politics. Okay, so these would be our subreddits if we want to <clears throat> continue to think about this as Reddit. So what we've got is a data frame that has 18,000 posts and three columns. We'll really only need this target name column. Now this example is from a book or an example somewhere. I don't remember. I would almost never actually give column names something with a space, but in this example they do. Um, general practice, don't use spaces and column names, but in Python it doesn't freak out quite so bad as it does in R. Okay. One thing you want to make sure you do is in any of these is delete empty documents. Okay. And so this will happen at the, you can do this at the beginning, actually a better place to do it is at the end, because after you do some text normalization, you might have empty documents by the time you're done and there's no more text <laughs> left because it was just one sentence and it was all stop words and so it gets taken out. But this is some code here that will help you find empty documents. Okay. So what we're doing here, data.article, that's the name of the column, Dot .str makes it a string. That's really important because if the, this, unlike R, if the um, text in the cell, right, that row and column is only a number, it'll treat it as a number. Even if the rest of the column is all, all characters. Okay, so unlike R where we have like, the column can only be one thing. And so it's gonna be the simplest thing, which is usually characters. Um, be sure you include this dot string. That will solve a lot of headaches. Um, I've learned this one the hard way, where something thinks it's numeric. You don't want it to be numeric. Dot strip here takes out all the extra white space. Slashes, slash in, slash r, slash t's, double spaces, just takes it all out. So I'm basically looking for any row that 
basically it's just a white space. And that um, shape dot zero here just allows us to count basically how many they are. So how many rows are just white space? Well, we have 515, that's not terrible, we have 18,000, so let's take those bad boys out. And this is cool code that I've never uh, had really seen before in Python. In R, I would do minus right, to drop those rows, but in Python, it's, that's the tilde. So drop all the rows that are only empty spaces. So now we're down to less, 18,000. Now let's normalize our corpus. So today I'm going to do this the long way. Next time I'm going to show you a shorter version of this um, where you write your own little function. Okay, so we're going to do this a couple of different ways uh, with the hope that by the time the end of the semester is over, you've seen this enough ways that you can cobble together the one that works for you. Because there's uh, things that you should do in text normalization, but there's no one right way to do it. Okay, except on your homework. All right, so remove the HTML. Notice here this string function again. So we're making sure that text is treated as a string or beautiful soup gets mad at you because it's like, I don't do numbers, meh. For, okay, so looping over here, uh, do the beautiful soup, take out just the text for every article in our articles. Here we're going to lowercase, so we can apply that function directly to the um, to the column. There's probably a way to apply the beautiful soup function directly to the column as well, but for some reason I think beautiful soup likes you to do the loop, the loop, the list loop. Um, but applying them like this is usually a little bit faster if you have a lot of text. So make it a string and lowercase it. Uh, contractions here. Uh, there's two ways to do it here. I've included both of them. This one I, to me is a little bit faster. Contractions.fix for text. I think that's what we did earlier in the semester, but this is another way you can do it. Unicode. So this is our Unicode code applied now to um, a pandas data frame. Here we're going to string replace and take out all of our special characters because we don't need them. Here we're going to stem all the characters. So this code is the code that we use in like week one and two, but is now applied to specifically a data frame. Drop all the nulls. Okay, so drop anything that's an NA now, an empty, empty set. And then I actually saved this because this code, depending on how many rows you have, can be slow. I think some of you guys have seen that. Notice I didn't do any spell checking because I fully expect there to be a lot of weird words in this kind of data, so no spell checking. Um, but I definitely uh, brain fart, brain fart, needed to take out a lot of this extra stuff. Now I also at this point, um, yeah, no, only no spell checking. Sorry. The question here is, do you need stimming or not? I find that stimming usually helps, but if it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt. Does that make sense? So it usually helps because it helps bring together the words that are the same, like walks, walking, walked, into one feature. But when I don't use it, it doesn't seem to hurt the model that much. Okay, so the, the gain for stimming is not often small. So I've saved this as, an, as a CSV so I can just import it again later. So I only have to run this section once. So for your final project, if you have this kind of problem where you have a ton of data, you don't want to run it over and over again because it takes forever, run it once, write it out, read it in later, and turn this section off. Do like eval equals false. And, I, and I'll still be able to see it. And you'll be like, I ran this once, now I'm going to re-import it so this whole thing goes faster. All right. So let's see, how did our normalization work? Well, it looks pretty good. It's going to be hard to read because we stemmed it. So I'll just read this out. Um, pretty, oops, sorry, pretty here. This is part of the stemming. Confuse, lack. Okay. Now some of these are things that don't make a lot of sense um, because of the way they got eaten or fixed. But um, 
closely, we can see that this is cleaner than it was, right? It has, we've lost all this uh, formatting, which was the main problem. All right, then we could take and split into our uh, testing and training data. Now this data set is split into three different columns and I actually went back later and took out the reason why the numbers are in here. So this piece actually is totally unnecessary. And we'll do a couple of examples where you can see like how to do it without this piece. Because we're really going to use the training and test corpus here and the training and test label names. So this function, te <clears throat> train, test, split, if I can try speaking again, la la la. So all the group names over here. And the function itself is um, you put in the um, piece that you want to split. So there's three of them because there's three splits to be had. And I'll talk about that in just a second. You tell it what the test size would be. So I did 20%. 80-20 splits, pretty common. And then a random state, and this is a Hitchhiker's Guide joke, but you can pick any number you want it out here. And so what we have is split it into two pieces. It's always two. Um, so split it into a corpus, split it into numbers, which we won't need, and then split it into names. Now what I've done here, and I don't, this isn't totally necessary, but to me it makes it run a little bit better, a little bit smoother, okay. is we've got our article, so I could just tell it split the article. But then it stays as pandas data series. And God bless pandas, but those data series can be a pain in the ass to work with. So what we're gonna do is make it into a, an array, and then it works better. Okay, we could also make it into a list, uh, but many of the functions we're going to use just seem to run better if it's an, uh, a NumPy array. But this piece right here is mainly just like, make sure this stupid thing is a string. And so a lot of our text processing is like dealing with the fact that, like if you took out every number, you wouldn't have to do this. But this just helps us make sure it stays strings. Because again, it will treat a cell that looks like a number and is only a number as a number. And that will not work for the functions we're going to use for feature extraction. Uh, so at some point, you've got to continue to convince it. This is a string. This is a string. And so this is a good way to do it. Okay, it looks wild. But basically, it's apply this to, this is like the apply function in R. Make sure that everything in this column is a string and convert it into an array. Whoops. Sorry, wrong way. Um, so what we end up with, back over here, our corpus, that's the documents, the set of things we want to extract text-wise, and then our, um, our train corpus and our test corpus shape. So we split in this into an 80-20 split. <clears throat> now, this honestly is just more to make sure that this isn't going to blow up but you really want to make sure you don't have empty or very small categories. Uh, and I talk about this when I teach logistic regression as like a statistical technique, but you really don't want your classes, your labels, to have a wide imbalance between them. So let's say you have 10 to 1 kind of a ratio, where you have 10, you know, 100 yeses and 10 noes. No algorithm, um, well, okay. Most of the time, the algorithm's going to go, well, they're all yes, because that's a really easy answer, and I'm getting most of them right. Okay. So if you know that the um, second label almost never occurs, why would you ever guess it? Okay. So we need to make sure that we have at least a rough balance. Okay, What's a perfect balance? I don't know. Right? One to one would be perfect, um, but reality doesn't always happen that way, where sometimes the data is 2 to 1 or 10 to 1. But when that happens, I always tell people to sample from the larger one to make it smaller. So yeah, you lose examples for your training and test data, but then you are at least being able to predict the smaller category. And often it's the smaller category we're more interested in anyway, right? because they're the oddball events. So predicting, um, you know, predicting diseases can be very difficult because they're not as likely as other things, and so we need to make sure our data sets have enough examples of the disease or the smaller category to be predicted at all. 
And I think it's a problem that we're seeing right now with all this COVID stuff. Well, we don't even have accurate texting. We don't know how accurate the tests are. <laughs> and it's really hard to, to measure these things um, because we don't have good data sets and the incident rate we can't even decide on, right? So there's a lot of those kind of problems with, uh, with these models that people are building because it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. You don't really know the accuracy of the things you are putting into your model. So who knows if the model is right. right. All right, we'll do more water. Mm -hmm. All right, so we can use this cool counter function to count how many we have in each category. NLTK has a cool function called frequency dist that would work here. Um, this is like the table function in R, basically. It's um, not as easy as table, but basically what you do is you create a dictionary and you count. Okay. And then I, uh, using, well, I didn't do this. <laughs> the book <laughs> did an example of how to convert this into pandas. Um, I will say I like R a lot better for this because it's like make me a table right, and stick that table in a data frame. But here we've got our comparison of the, the actual label that we have, the, la the number of those we have in training, the number of those we have in testing, and then they're, they're kind of the reverse sorted. So what I can tell is that I have um, Roughly equal numbers. We don't have as much religion, but this isn't a, a bad balance. Right? It's not like this is five and these are 800. And then in our testing data, again, we have a, a similar pattern where they're all roughly equal. Okay. And the smaller one is just a little bit smaller. <clears throat> but this would not cause me any concern. So mainly you want to make sure there are no zeros here and no very small categories. If you have a lot of categories and one of them is very small, consider eliminating it because you're not going to have an easy time predicting it. All right, now all the fun stuff, feature extraction. So what are features, right? <clears throat> it's something that's measurable. So we're going to convert text into a number. Right? So far, everything we've kind of done is converting text into an answer, into another piece of text. But now we're going to figure out a way to convert text into a number because any technique you use uses numbers to predict the categories. Okay. We're going to say we're predicting from words, but we've converted those words into a number somehow. I could simply count, is the option present or not? And if you've looked through NLTK, it does a, a bunch of examples like this, where it's literally, is that word present in the document or not? <clears throat> so I could do a yes, no. Um, this is similar to one-hot encoding. It exists or it doesn't. But we still have to figure out how to um, transform that text data into that kind of feature structure. So let's look here. The most popular way to do this is called the bag of words method. I use the bag of words method all the time. It's great. It's wonderful. It's one of my favorite inventions. Okay, And it's so simple because it is literally just a count. So you create a vector or a column for each document. You create a vocabulary. Here are all the possible words after I've done all of my work on them and cleaned them up. And then it's just a table. It's literally a frequency table of how many times each word occurred in each document. Okay, that would be a count vectorizer. Or it could be binary. Yes, the word occurred, or no, it doesn't. So somehow in each cell where I have vocabulary by document or term by document, it's often what it's called, I have a number in that cell. Zero means it didn't happen, it never occurred. One means it happened, or I could use a count, literal count, one, two, three, up to whatever number there is. I always recommend the count encoding because sometimes the uh, it's not the presence of the word that matters, it's the amount of times you use that word. But you could test both methods and see which one works better. And so that's the bag of words method. It's very popular. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll see a bag of engrams method, <clears throat> which is instead of using single words as a vocabulary, 
Uh, instead, we're going to use phrases as our vocabulary. And so instead of saying uh, cheese, whiz, two different words, we would include cheese, whiz as one phrase. Okay. Now, the problem with this type of method is that it compounds, a, creates, compounds, exacerbates, um, synonyms here, um, makes some things more problematic. So any type of bag of words method, anything we're going to cover, okay, there are several bag of words methods, has a problem of what's called data sparsity, okay, where if I have a vocabulary by documents matrix, there are a lot of zeros. Okay, so some words occur in one document and one document only. And some documents just don't have any of these words. So there are a lot of holes. No, they're not holes, they're zeros. And a lot of very small cells, ones, twos. That kind of sparsity is well known, and there are ways to deal with it. But as I go from using one grams, one word at a time, to n grams, two words, three words, phrasal structures at a time, I make that sparsity problem worse. Okay. Because phrases are less likely than individual words, obviously. Okay. So careful here is that that creates more feature combinations at smaller frequencies. And then often the phrases are not unique. So one word could get counted multiple times. <clears throat> now, uh, if I had to pick bag of words, the most common bag of words method, it would be TFIDF. Okay, it's still a bag of words method. It just has a transform applied to it. So you take that count set and you um, apply this term frequency, inverse document frequency transform. And that normalizes the bag of words. Um, I hope you guys can hear him. the dog is, it's 8 o'clock, it's dinner time, so he's barking. Um, our house is a zoo. That normalizes the matrix right, into a number that represents the importance of each word or words to a document, given all other documents. There are other normalizing methods that you can use, but definitely TFIDF is the most popular. If you Google TFIDF, there's a ton of documentation on it. It is the number one bag of words method. Okay. People treat these as separate things, but really what happens is a TFIDF transform is applied to a count bag of words. Okay. So they're not really different things. They're just different forms of the same matrix. I like TFIDF myself because instead of a number being a raw count, it's a count in perspective. It, it measures the um, usefulness of, or the kind of weight of that word given how many times the word occurs in every document and how many words are in that document. Okay, so it's kind of a conditional probability of the kind of the fact that this word is used a lot. So its weight for this document is not so important because it's used a ton of times. Or this word is very unique, and this document doesn't have very many words, so this is a very important word. Okay. So it helps us kind of normalize, and it also solves some of the sparsity problem. Okay. It doesn't do anything about the zeros, but it helps control the fact that this is very skewed. Okay. So it's a weighting scheme. It's not really its own method, it's a weighting scheme. There are other ways to vectorize data. Okay, we're going to do some of them um, later, uh, like word to vec. Okay, I think of the word to vec sections in the, the um, sentiment analysis section, but we are going to talk about word to vec at some point in the next couple weeks. Okay. What word to vec is? It's developed originally was developed by Google. Actually, it's a simple neural net model, meaning there's one hidden layer. Complex neural net models are often called deep learning. They have more than one hidden layer. So um, you were asking me earlier about a long short-term memory um, model. That's a deep learning model because it has more than one um, hidden layer. Or it's has one. Okay, so it's a simple neural net model. Um, I, I don't love the phrase deep learning <laughs> because like it implies something that I think it's not, but it is more complex learning than a simple neural net. And the reason you might use a word to vec 
over bag of words is that it includes context. So the biggest criticism of a bag of words method is that you lose all context. You take the words from a document and put them in a bag and shake them up. It's kind of the idea from, from the terminology here. And that just totally ignores where the word was in the sentence. So sarcasm, um, analogies, uh, any type of, of sense of meaning is totally lost. Okay. Those multiple senses of words, polysemes that we've talked about that have multiple meanings, just kind of gets averaged over everything. Now, bag of words models can capture this effect. And um, I'll talk about that more in my other class. But, you know, you can see the differences in their usage based on the words around them in the other documents. But a word effect model is meant to solve that problem. Okay. It includes context by looking at a small word window. Okay. So uh, the name kind of comes from the fact that it converts a single word into a vector. So it says, well, here's the word and here are the words around it. So I'm going to create that word as a kind of a, a vector of all of the things that it sees you know, it includes context. Okay. And so it kind of mimics reading by creating these little word windows. And sometimes uh, uh, those word windows are created through a continuous bag of words encoding, or what's called skip gram encoding. I'll talk about both of those later. But the short version of it is that continuous bag of words encoding takes the window, six words at a time, ten words at a time, whatever, and includes all of them to help you predict basically uh, the next word. Uh, skip gram encoding uh, takes that idea but links each word individually. Okay. So in a continuous bag of words effect, the, the prediction is averaged over that vector. and a skip gram encoding, the prediction is tied to each individual word, but they're all used. Basic gist. <laughs> Some other types of models include GLOVE, Stanford, Fast text, Facebook, <clears throat> or different forms of word to vec with tweaks. Okay. <clears throat> We're only going to do word to vec because it's the easiest one to implement. Um, Glove is available, but it kind of requires some Java, which we've already you know, dealt with enough this semester. You can actually also do fast test, <clears throat> fast text very easily in Gensum. Um, I have trouble with it sometimes. That might be the user though. <laughs> so I've generally found that if a word to vec, a neural net model is going to work, word to vec works great. Okay. It is um, stupidly easy. So that's all the feature extraction stuff. Okay. So we're mostly going to focus here on count vectorizing and um, TF IDF vectorizing uh, transforms. And then we'll also look at word to vec at some point. There are other ways to do feature extraction. You could look at the number of vowels. You could look at the number of six letter words. You could um, look at repetition. So there are other features that you could extract. But the, uh, the, the bag of words method tends to capture that kind of stuff. So it really depends on what you're trying to predict. And generally, with the kinds of things that we're interested in, bag of words works great. The other half of that is the classification algorithm. Okay. So we'll look at a couple of these, but multinomial naive Bayes, because we have a multinomial problem, okay, which is pretty popular. Logistic regression, no most popular, <laughs> because it's easy. Uh, and then we'll also do support vector machines. And just to show you kind of like how the choice of a feature and the choice of algorithm matters. So you get different answers based on which of those two things you vary. And so my suggestion, since the point here is to find the best prediction, is to try all of them if you have the time and coding energy. Okay. So depending on the size of the problem too, right? So if you can only run one, pick one that other people have used. Um, but if you have the computing power to run all of them, you know, try. Pick the one that runs best. So kind of back to the original question about naive Bayes tends to work well for this kind of thing. I don't have a good answer, except that I don't see in my own work the added benefit of a complex model, because we, we did this exact thing where we had 
three or four algorithms and three or four extraction procedures and I was very surprised which one works best um, because I would have expected um, a topics model or an LSA type model to work best and it did not. So uh, try them all is my answer. <laughs> which as a statistician is a little uncomfortable. But in this scenario, um, the goal is to make the best prediction. So, right. You can also do random forests, gradient boosting machines, and there's more. So I've included uh, two articles uh, that are the like kind of top ones people are doing right now. Next week could be a different thing, but this is kind of the main thing that people are doing. All right. So let's get into the practicalities of like, um, how do I know which model? I said I just told you run them all. How do you know which one's best? Right. So uh, what we want to look at is accuracy. This is the most obvious way to determine what's best. Okay. Is the model accurate? Can I actually predict the outcome? Okay. Which I think in statistics sometimes gets lost because we're looking at um, you know r squared and seeing how much variance we can predict. Um, people talk about like oh, I can predict 10% of the variance. I'm like, well, that's actually not very good, <laughs> and it's good for people because people are difficult to predict um, often. But in reality, that like kind of accuracy is not very good. Okay. So accuracy here will depend. There is no gold standard. There might be a a common set of rules for your specific task, but I would argue that there is not one accuracy number that is correct. So there are some tasks where you cannot get to 90% or 80% or whatever rule someone has written about on one of these blogs. Okay? It depends on previous work in that area. You're trying to get better than somebody else's. Okay. Uh, we'll also talk about precision, recall, and the F1 score. Okay. So these are measures of, of kind of measures of accuracy for each individual classification label. To do that, I'm going to do a brief example here. So hold the news groups thing for next week, but let's look at a, a, a fairly simple example to help us understand what these classification pieces mean. So there's a breast cancer data set in Scikit-Learn, I think. That is a yes-no example. So let's look at how evaluation might work. The data set has already been coded for features. So this particular data set is not an example of an NLP, right? This is coded for medical questions, not text. Okay, but it's a pre-built data set that's good for explaining um, uh, confusion, excuse me, confusion matrices. Okay. So we're going to do a binary classification and use logistic regression because that works really great for binary classification. Okay, it's also very easy to implement. So I'm going to load this breast cancer data, okay, and then I'm just going to say X is my data. I'm not going to split this into test and train. I'm just going to kind of show you a very brief example here. So X is the um, data data. The uh, Y is the target. So X here is our, our predictive features. Let's pretend for a second that this is um, uh, text somehow. Okay, And Y is, is it breast cancer or not? And here's what we're actually predicting with. Oh, I am going to split into test and train. I lied to you. Uh, this is the example that I think you should use on your homework. Okay, it's much simpler. So split X into a test and train. So, uh, and then split Y into test and train. 80, 20 split. And okay. we have 400 examples to train with and 100 examples to test with. We, uh, since we have our features already made, let's just now import the model and see what we can do. So we're going to import linear model, which is a little odd since logistic is a logic model, but whatever. Um, the main rule in Python is start with a blank model, then fit the data to it. So here is our blank logistic regression model. This is the new default solver. Okay. Um, but I always just make it explicit so it doesn't give me a, a warning. I also had to turn up the iterations a little bit to make this run, but it runs fine. Here are all the defaults otherwise that it gave you. 
An L2 penalty is pretty normal. Um, Multi-class is now set to auto in the newer versions of Scikit-Learn. You used to have to set it to, um, to something. I don't even remember anymore, but um, you used to have to set it. But now it's auto, so if you have more than two, it will actually handle that automatically for you. So these are pretty good defaults. So build a blank model, fit the data to it, so dot fit. So this is where you put in your training data, x comma y. And then what we'll do is we'll evaluate by creating a confusion matrix. Okay. So confusion matrix explains to us what precision and recall are okay, and accuracy. Um, and it's a great way to examine the... Um, the usefulness of each category. So the problem with accuracy overall is it doesn't tell me anything useful about the individual categories. It tells me how good the model is overall. Okay. If I had a 10 to 1 ratio, that number could be very high, but I could be totally crap at predicting one category. So you always want to look at some sort of confusion matrix or precision and recall by category, because you could have a model that never predicts one of the categories, okay, and that's no good. Models that never predict a category correctly are totally useless. <laughs> so even if accuracy is high, if you never get one of them right, you cannot predict that one. Um, so the confusion matrix looks at the uh, predicted label versus the actual label. So you would do one of these basically for each combination. In a, in a two-class outcome, it's either is breast cancer or not, but in a multi-class outcome you have to make one table for is hockey or is one of the others. So these, um, once you get more categories, are still a two by two. You either get it right or you get it wrong. Okay. Um, in, a, in the multi-class scenario you can get it wrong a lot of ways. So we'll actually look at a bigger matrix too. And this is a great way to tell where things go right or wrong. That's really useful because that can help you um, troubleshoot. So something else we're going to add here is you can write in R, you can write, uh, I'm sorry, you can write a separate little Python uh, file, like a .r script, and this I took from the textbook, but these kinds of scripts are really handy if you have like a bunch of functions, right? What's the, what's the rule? If you do it more than twice, write a function for it. So you, you could create yourself a little Python script that has a bunch of functions that you've used over and over again. And you could tell it to just load all of those functions. Okay. This also works for importing packages. So if you had like, you know, okay, I know in this particular thing I need to import. Um, I need a text normalization function. I need to import all these stupid packages. You could put that into a separate source Python piece and um, just call it over and over again. So that might be one way to simplify what you are pasting over and over again. So this particular one has these kind of cute confusion matrix in it. Now I will tell you that Scikit-Learn has some really great built-in stuff, but this is me also showing you some, some ways to make your coding a little bit easier. All right, what I would do is predict. So we fit the model, now let's predict. So I'm predicting my test here. So using X, predict Y. And let's see what we got right. So display confusion matrix. We put in the true labels, Y, the predicted labels, um, and the class labels themselves. So this would be words. And our breast cancer example here, these are numbers. Everything along the diagonal here is correct. It's actually zero, and I predicted it to be zero. Cool. It's actually one, and I predicted it to be one. So accuracy is a measure of how much things are on the diagonal versus not. So this would be 109 divided by 109 plus 5, 114. Okay, so we're doing really well here. I can get that actual number here in a minute. And so let's see, where are we at? I don't want to get like too far into all this stuff because then it gets, we only like go halfway through it. So let me talk briefly about this particular slide and then I'll come, we'll start here again next week and come back to like 
explaining them over and over again, uh, going through them one at a time in the data set. Okay. So confusion matrix, you can do this either way. Um, the actual value by the predicted values or the actual by the predicted is a map. Okay. The idea here is, let's look, talk about breast cancer. Um, the actual value being positive, yes, you have it. Predicted value being positive, yes, you have it. Okay, that's called a true positive because it was positive. It was that category and you said it was that category. So when we say positive here, what we mean is that it is the category you were predicting. So in our 20 news groups example, let's say we're trying to predict the hockey group. Positive here would be it is the hockey group and I predicted it to be the hockey group. I think sometimes um, when, I, when I teach this, it gets confusing because like uh, a positive means a positive test or something because medical examples just work really well here. But here we mean positive being the category is you're trying to predict. Okay. So it is hockey and I said it was hockey. It's true positive. Okay. Sometimes this is called a hit in um, signal detection theory. Now if the actual value is a negative, and I said it was positive, that's a false positive. Okay, so uh, it's not hockey, but I said it was. Okay, or it's not breast cancer, I said it was. This is also um, the uh, type 1 error rate, okay, or alpha in statistics. So you said something was there and it's not. Okay, so that's a false positive, you're getting it wrong. Um, <clears throat> Alright, that has a name, hit false positives. Um, I forget what false positives are called in signal detection stuff, but okay, let's say the actual value is positive and we, we missed it. Okay, this is called miss. Um, somebody remember? False alarm, thank you. Yeah, false alarm. So uh, it was positive and you missed it. It's called a false negative or miss. Uh, this is beta or type two error okay, uh, where Something's there, but you didn't find it. Okay, so it was hockey, but you said it wasn't. Um, yeah, COVID test. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Hold that. Hold that thought right there. Uh, a true negative okay, is where it wasn't there, and you said it wasn't there. Okay, so it's not hockey, and it really isn't hockey. Okay. True positives sometimes in statistical terms power. Okay. True negatives don't um, really have a good statistics example, but in signal detection theory, it's called a, a correct rejection. And so a lot of this is used by the medical community. And so back to your COVID example here, it is a perfect example um, because these, term, these terms used in the medical scenarios are sometimes called sensitivity and specificity, okay, which is a ratio. And those are very similar to recall and precision. So these are different terms, uh, different and same math used for different areas. Okay, so it's positive predictive value and negative predictive value are the other terms that you'll hear. So when you hear people talking on TV about sensitive, how sensitive is the test and how specific is the test, um, that's very similar to what we're doing here. But we want to know if I say it's truly positive, how accurate that is right? um, in comparison to false positives. And if I say it's truly positive, how accurate that is into false negatives. Okay? And those tests that have high numbers in both are sensitive and specific. So two very, um, <clears throat> one second on your question. Two very sensitive and specific tests. One for pregnancy is very sensitive and very specific, okay. um, and one for a, uh, HIV. Right. Uh, so sensitivity is. Uh, let me do this as a pregnancy example. Uh, if you get a positive, it's probably a positive. So high sensitivity number tells you that it's probably not a false positive. So I, I think I have these in the right order, but it's that idea that like if the pregnancy test is positive, time to go to the doctor. Okay. Specific means that it doesn't, um, <clears throat> it doesn't this way, false negative. So if you get a positive, um, it's not likely to be a, a, a miss, right? And so I, when I think about specific, it's like that test doesn't also answer something else. Uh, and you can look all those up. I find that people sensitivity don't write these in the most specificity um, useful way. Like, look for a chart. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
I'm sorry, specificity here is based on false positives. So uh, you don't want to miss it. I said the right thing, I don't want to miss it, but they're based on false positives versus true negatives. Uh, that's not quite what we're going to do. We're going to do um, across and down and ignore true negatives, actually. But um, this concept um, is very similar to the ones that you are seeing and hearing on TV right now. So fail to reject, well, depends, right? So good question. Let's say if I fail to reject. Right, so fail to reject would be the predictive value and you would say it's negative, right, here. Um, if it was actually positive, there was something there and you just missed it, that would be a false negative and that's um, a type two error, right, beta, where you fail to reject but you should have. Okay. Uh, let's say you fail to reject and you were supposed to, that's a true negative, so you got the answer right, it's just, your research didn't support, you know, your research didn't find something that wasn't there. Um, specificity here, make sure I get them in the right orders. Specificity is when you, in this case, didn't find the thing and it's really not there. Right, so yeah, um, your analogy is correct. 